interprets. All right, look with me if you would. Genesis chapter 39. Let's talk about the interpretation belongs to God. Genesis 39, beginning in verse 19. It says, when Potiphar heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Look at chapter 40, verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked the Pharaoh's officials, uh, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. I'm not going to go into the details of the dreams. Uh, they tell Joseph their dreams. Jo Joseph interprets them. Uh, and the, the upshot was that he said to the cupbearer, in three days you're going to be restored to your job. And to the baker, he said, in three days you're going to be executed. Yikes. Let's look at verse 20 and finish reading. Chapter 40, verse 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that once again he put the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the people that you love so much. Thanks for your presence with us and for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, speak to us this morning. Let each one hear a word from heaven. Let us encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. God makes a promise and then there is a process that leads to the fulfillment of his promise. That is the story of every hero of faith in the Bible. That has been our story again and again, a promise and then a process. When I met Denise in September of 1992, the first day we met, the Lord spoke to me and said, she's going to be your wife. The Lord spoke to her at the same exact instant but she did not admit that to me until after we were engaged two and a half years later. God made a promise, but then there was a process that we had to go through of pursuit and friendship and courtship and falling in love and engagement. One night in April of 1996, I was working in my office at the Assemblies of God Seminary. I was working quite late that night, and one of our professors, Dr. Jim Wood, walked in, and he looked at me, and he said to me, I know where you belong. And I knew when he said it that God was speaking through him. He was referring to the associate pastor position here at Harvest Time Church. God made a promise but then there was a process that we had to walk through of interviewing and coming here to candidate and waiting for a job offer. In January of 1999, just before I was installed as the senior pastor of Harvest Time, the Lord spoke to me as clearly as I have ever heard his voice. And he said to me, be strong and very courageous. You will lead these people to inherit the land that I've promised them. 
We were trying to buy this property at the time. But I knew that that promise meant more than just purchasing this land. I knew it meant building phase one and phase two. God made a promise, but then there has been a lengthy process. Literally thousands of hours of planning meetings and zoning hearings and board meetings and prayer meetings and raising millions of dollars. And the process still isn't finished, but we're very, very close now. God makes a promise that's glorious, but then there's a process that's grueling. That is the story of Joseph. Right now, we're looking together at stories of faith. We're looking at some of the heroes of the Bible, specifically at defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them? What encouragement can we take from them? You see, as a congregation, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. We're just a few short weeks now from realizing the fulfillment of a dream that started 20 years ago. And I know in my spirit that when we cross over the physical threshold of that building, we're also going to step into a season of fulfillment of many prophecies. But right now we have a challenge in front of us. We still need about $250,000 or a little more to finish the sanctuary and get a certificate of occupancy. So we're asking all of you to stand with us in prayer. Beloved, please pray with us. Pray with us. Pray with us. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's not by the strength or the cleverness of men. It's by what the Holy Spirit does. So we need you to pray with us. And we need you to give. And we need you to believe with us. You see, when we need faith, the place to turn is the Bible. We started looking at Abraham, the man of faith. We looked at Isaac and Jacob. Today I want to look at Joseph. In an Egyptian prison dungeon, Joseph had a defining moment of faith. He said to the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, interpretation belongs to God. Do you know that was a powerful declaration of faith? Joseph not only had the faith that God owned the interpretation to these two Egyptians' dreams, but in a dungeon, Joseph also had faith that God still owned the interpretation to Joseph's dream. God made a promise to Joseph when he was just 17 years old through two dreams, but the interpretation of those dreams belonged entirely to God. The details of how those dreams would play out in Joseph's life belonged to God. The prolonged, circuitous process that would lead to the fulfillment of those dreams belonged to God. The ultimate meaning and purpose belonged to God. Yes, Joseph's brother and even his father would eventually bow down to him, but the purpose was to save all of their lives. In the meantime, Joseph would bear a heavy burden on their behalf. That was a hidden interpretation that belonged to God. And the same is true for all of us. God has made promises to us all. Do you know, as believers in Jesus, we are all recipients of great and precious promises God has given us in his word. And more than that, as individuals, we are also recipients of personal promises that God makes to us by his Holy Spirit. God puts personal dreams in our heart. Some of us have received literal dreams. I've received many. But the interpretation belongs to God. The details of how the dream plays out belong to God. The process by which his promise is fulfilled belongs to God. The ultimate meaning and purpose belongs to God. Looking at Joseph, I see a few keys for clinging to faith while God is working out his interpretation. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. The interpretation belongs to God. A few keys to clinging to faith 
while God works out his interpretation, first of all, believe that God is still with you even when things are going from bad to worse. Believe that God is still with you even when. In Joseph's life, God made a promise through two dreams and immediately things started going from bad to worse. In the first dream, Joseph saw all of his brothers bowing down to him. He shared that dream with his brothers and they didn't take kindly to it. In the second dream, Joseph saw all of his brothers and his father and his mother bowing down to him. He shared that dream and not only were his brothers insulted, but his father was insulted. Sometime later, Joseph's 10 older brothers were out with him, uh, were out uh, watching the herds, and Jacob sent Joseph to go check on them. He said, go look after the welfare of your brothers. He had no idea how prophetic those words were because Joseph was about to begin a 12-year journey through hell on behalf of the welfare of his brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they said, oh, look, here comes that dreamer. When he reached them, they stripped away his coat that his father had given him. They put him in a pit. They thought to kill him, but then they decided to sell him to a caravan headed towards Egypt. In Egypt, Joseph was bought by Potiphar, the captain of the guard. I don't know why I never noticed it before, but Potiphar was a military man. He was a career military man. In fact, he was the top-ranking officer in Egypt, a four-star general, if you will, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You know, military men are cut from a different cloth than other men. He was not the brainy accountant type. He was not the schmoozing sales business type. He was not the sensitive, creative type. He was the, you touch my wife and I'll rip your face off type. <laughs> for a while, things started looking up for Joseph. Everything he touched turned to gold. So Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything in his house except what Potiphar ate. But there was a problem. Mrs. Potiphar. She began making advances towards Joseph. Joseph kept dodging her, but one day she cornered him. Joseph ran away from her, but she grabbed his coat and she ripped it right off of him. Someone once said, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And in Mrs. Potiphar's case, that certainly was true. She held up Joseph's coat to the household staff and to her husband and said, this Hebrew slave tried to force himself on me. That's twice that Joseph had a coat of favor taken away from him. And for the second time, he's put in a pit. Genesis 40 calls the dungeon a pit where he is. Potiphar is seething with anger. But the Hebrew text is a little ambivalent about just who he's angry with. It seems that if Potiphar really believed his wife's story, he would have just executed Joseph. That would have been standard. But instead, he puts Joseph in a dungeon in the basement of his own house. And Joseph was there for a very long time, perhaps almost 10 years. Being that Potiphar was the captain of the guard, his house was attached to a garrison of soldiers. And part of that complex included a dungeon for special political prisoners. Three times in Genesis, it mentions that Joseph was imprisoned in Potiphar's house. I never really realized the impact of that. But the entire time that Joseph was in prison, he was directly under the feet of the woman who falsely accused him and the boss who wrongly convicted him. The entire time Joseph was in prison, he suffered the daily indignity of being a prisoner in the very house over which he was once 
supervisor. The entire time, Mrs. Potiphar knew that Joseph was beneath her feet suffering and he knew that she was over his head gloating. You want to talk about being crushed under the enemy's feet. Can I tell you, sometimes we go through seasons like that too. Here we are just like Joseph. We have this promise from God. We have this dream that God has put inside of us to do something good with our life that brings glory to God and that benefits many. But, but then things start going from bad to worse. Maybe we suffer betrayal at the hands of someone closest to us. Maybe things that are precious to us are traumatically stripped away from us. Perhaps we're falsely accused by someone and wrongly convicted by the rest. Maybe we find ourselves in a situation where we're confined, we're stuck in an uncomfortable place, perhaps even a humiliating situation, and we're unable to break free and escape from that. And maybe for just a little while, it looks like things might get better, and then they take a turn that's infinitely worse. Perhaps worst of all is the indignity of squirming under our enemy's feet. Worst of all is when the person or the people that did us dirty laugh while we suffer in their plain sight. Beloved, in moments like that, all we can do is cling to faith that God is still with us. Do you know, four times... In Genesis 39, it says God was with Joseph. Genesis 39 opens with the words, God was with Joseph. And it closes with the words, God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph when his coat of many colors was stripped from him. God was with Joseph when they lowered him into the first pit. He was with Joseph when he was sold to the Midianites. He was with Joseph when he went down to Egypt. He was with Joseph when the second coat was taken from him. He was with Joseph when he went down into the dungeon, the second pit. Things went from bad to worse, but God was with Joseph the entire time. And the same thing is true for us when everything seems to be going down, down, down. You know, we wonder sometimes, God's an awfully busy guy running the universe. We wonder sometimes, is he really aware of the details of our life? Does he know what's going on? Is he really in that much control? Can I tell you from the story of Joseph yes 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 he absolutely is you know that Joseph more detail is given about the life of Joseph than any other character in the book of Genesis the account of creation is about three percent of the book of Genesis the life of Joseph is 30 percent of the book of Genesis and God goes into explicit detail about all kinds of things that happen. Like, for example, when Jacob sent Joseph out looking for his brothers, he couldn't find them. And so he just happens to come across a stranger in the wilderness. And he says, hey, I'm looking for my brothers. And the stranger just happened to have encountered his brothers and overheard them saying they were going this way. Now, if Joseph had not met that man, he would have never found his brothers. They were only 14 miles away. That's not far to walk when you know what direction to go. He would have gone home to his father. He wouldn't have gone down to Egypt. You see, God was in charge of every little detail of his journey, even having him encounter just by chance a stranger in the wilderness who just happened to run into his brothers. And we come into these seasons in our lives when everything is going down, down, down. And we wonder, has God forsaken us? Can I tell you, beloved, God has not revoked his promise. He has not changed his mind about you. He hasn't withdrawn the dream. The interpretation belongs to God. 
the mysterious way that his plan unfolds in our life belongs to him. The details of our day-to-day experiences belong to him. The purpose of it all belongs to him. The timetable for our deliverance and our vindication belongs to him. When things are going from bad to worse, may we find the faith of Joseph to say, God, I don't understand your ways, but the interpretation belongs to you, and I trust that you are still with me. The interpretation belongs to God. Some keys to clinging to faith while God is working out his interpretation. Believe that God is with you. Second, believe that God's light in you is stronger than the darkness in the darkest place. Do you know that Joseph is the only man in the book of Genesis who is described as filled with the Holy Spirit? Potiphar did not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But when he met Joseph, he knew that God was with Joseph. The prison warden didn't know God, but when he met Joseph, he knew that God was with Joseph. Pharaoh didn't know God, but when he met Joseph, he said, can we find anyone else like this man? The spirit of the living God is inside of him. And as God unfolds his purpose in your life, you too will encounter all kinds of people who don't know God, but when they meet you, they will know that God is with you. Looking at Joseph in the dungeon, I see a few keys for shining God's light in the darkest place. First of all, don't surrender to sensuality. Don't surrender to sensuality. Egypt was entirely given over to sensuality, to indulging their appetites. We see that in Potiphar. He put Joseph in charge of everything in his house except his daily menu. Potiphar was a foodie. So much so that he was content to let Joseph run all of his business affairs. He didn't even look at what Joseph was doing so long as Potiphar could eat whatever he wanted. Maybe as the captain of the guard, he was on some kind of high-protein, low-carb diet to keep his physique in shape. Maybe he obsessed over his body like so many people do today. Whatever the case, his food was more important to him than his own business affairs. And then there's Mrs. Potiphar, who was given over to pleasure. Someone wrote this about Mrs. Potiphar. They said she is the real slave in this story. She was captive to her own addiction. And then we discover that Pharaoh is a foodie too. After a bad meal, he threw the cupbearer and the baker into the clink. But Joseph refused to surrender to the sensuality. When Mrs. Potiphar began making her advances, Genesis 39.10 says that Joseph refused to even be around her. He didn't linger in her company even for a second longer than he had to. He didn't listen to her propositions. He didn't pause on the channel or the website with something sensual on it. He just kept clicking right on through. Joseph refused to surrender to sensuality because he knew that God was with him. Even if Potiphar never knew what happened behind closed doors, God knew. Joseph said, how can I sin against him? God wasn't only with Joseph in the pit and in the prison. God was just as much with Joseph in the corridors of Potiphar's house and of Pharaoh's palace. You know, in the Bible, Egypt is a symbol for the world. It's a symbol for human society without God. And it's true that this world is just as full of Potiphar's and Mrs. Potiphar's and Pharaoh's as it ever was. But if we believe that God is with us, we won't surrender to their sensuality. A few keys to shine in God's light in the darkest place. Don't surrender to sensuality. And second, stay sensitive to opportunities to minister to others. The prison warden immediately recognizes that God is with Joseph 
And so he puts Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. Into the prison come two high-profile characters from Pharaoh's palace, the cupbearer and the baker. Rather than a pastry chef, the baker was probably really like the head of the kitchen staff. Uh, you might call him the head waiter. These two men were entrusted with the life of Pharaoh. They ensured that no one put any poison in his food or in his drink. Joseph is assigned to wait on the sommelier and the head waiter for a long time. You know, how wise is God? Joseph was headed, he didn't know it, but he was headed for Pharaoh's palace. So God brings the two men who are closest to Pharaoh and he lets them spend time with Joseph for a long time. They know all of Pharaoh's likes and dislikes. They know all of his idiosyncrasies. They know all of his pet peeves. They know his way of conducting business when he's sitting at table. They know how to behave in his presence. And they told all of these things to Joseph while he waited on them day after day after day. One day, Joseph notices that his friends are not right. He notices that their countenance is downcast. And he asked them, what's the matter? Now, I want you to notice with me Joseph's sensitivity in a very harsh environment. Who would notice someone having a bad day in a dungeon? <laughs> hey, cupbearer. Hey, baker. What's wrong with you guys today? What do you mean, what's wrong? We're in prison, you mope. <laughs> it's, it, everybody's having a bad day in a dungeon. But Joseph noticed something was up. And he took the opportunity to minister to them. You know, this gives us such insight into the character of Joseph. He wasn't eaten up with bitterness. He wasn't consumed with self-pity. He wasn't preoccupied with his own plight or gaining his own freedom. He was open to being used by God to bless someone right there in the dungeon. And we need to be the same way. A few keys to shine in God's light in the darkest places. Don't surrender to sensuality. Stay sensitive and believe that the Holy Spirit in you is more powerful than people's spirituality. The chief sommelier and the head waiter are down because they both had a dream and there were no Egyptian dream interpreters to tell them the meaning. The Egyptians had very strong beliefs about dreams. They believed that the gods spoke through dreams. They believed that if you had a pair of dreams, that it surely meant that what you dreamt would come to pass. And they had interpreters who had books of symbols to help you understand your dreams. The reason the men are down is because they don't have access to a dream interpreter. Now Joseph could have said to himself, you know, these guys, these Egyptians, their spirituality is a lot different from mine, so I'm not going to get involved here. They believe differently from me, so I'm not going to bother with them with what I believe. They're into spooky stuff, so I'm not going to talk to them about holy stuff. No, Joseph said, interpretation belongs to God. Tell me your dream, boys. You see, Joseph believed that the power of the Holy Spirit in him was more powerful than the spirituality of the Egyptians. He believed that God would use him right there on the spot in the dungeon. He believed that the chief Somalia and the head waiter would receive God's touch through him right there in the darkest place. He believed, listen to this, that God was just as much in control of the destinies of those two Egyptians as God was in control of Joseph's destiny. How's that for a thought? You know that worker who sits next to you and swears like a truck driver? God is just as interested in her destiny as he is in yours. Your boss, the devil... 
God is just as interested in his destiny as he is in yours. Beloved, we need that bold kind of faith to believe that God is just as much invested in the lives of the people that he's put in our orbit as he's invested in our life. We need the bold faith to believe that the Holy Spirit in us is more powerful than any other kind of spirituality that people around us might be involved in. The Holy Spirit can use us, and he will. We need the kind of bold faith that says, you know, I noticed something's not right with you today. What's wrong? Can I pray for you? I really want to encourage you about those daytime sessions with Randy Clark because this is precisely what he's going to be teaching about in those daytime sessions. How to be used by the Holy Spirit even in a darkest place, even in a dungeon. How to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to look at someone and know when God wants to use you to minister to them. You know what I love about Randy is he, he was a Baptist. He got royally zapped by the Holy Spirit ended up leading the Toronto outpouring blessing sessions. But what I love about Randy is because he comes from that strong teaching background, he's able to talk about moving in the things of the Spirit and being used in the things of the Spirit, and you can actually wrap your mind around it. You can actually say, yeah, I get that, and I can do that. You know, Some of our beautiful friends, I love them, but they just, they just live in the stratosphere. We have a little joke. Years ago, Pastor Nick was teaching a Bible study years and years ago, and there was a woman there, uh, first time ever in a church like ours, and, and she came up to him at the end of the Bible study with all the sincerity in her heart, and she said to him, you know, I didn't understand a word you said, but it was beautiful. <laughs> Every week after Nick or I preach, that's what we say to each other. I didn't understand a word you said, but it was beautiful. Some of our friends, I don't understand a word they say, but it was beautiful. But, but what I love about Randy's teaching is he takes these things of the Spirit and he just brings them, breaks them down and presents them in such a way that you can wrap your, your mind around it and say, yeah, I can be used by God like Joseph was in a dungeon. A few keys to shine in God's light in the darkest places. Don't surrender to sensuality. Stay sensitive. Believe the Holy Spirit in you is powerful. And serve the dreams of others, even if it doesn't seem to serve any purpose. You see, sometimes while we're waiting for our own dreams to come true, God presents us with an opportunity to serve someone else's dream for a little while. Joseph doesn't even understand the meaning of his own dream. He doesn't even understand how his own dream is unfolding. He doesn't understand what Egypt or Potiphar or Mrs. Potiphar or this prison has anything to do with his brothers and his father bowing down to him. And yet here he is interpreting the dreams of the sommelier and the head waiter. It doesn't make any sense. God allowed him to decipher their details when he couldn't even decipher his own. And sometimes it's that way with God. Lord, I know that you've called me to such and such a ministry, but here I am right now serving the ministry of another man or another woman. Lord, you've called me to this platform or, or to this platform, and here I am waving my hands in the parking lot. We're serving downstairs. Lord, you called me to the nations. And here I am in Connecticut. <laughs> here I am in New York. Keep on serving, Joseph. Because soon enough, you'll see that the key to your dream was serving someone else's dream for a little while. The interpretation belongs to God. Clinging to faith. While he's working out his interpretation, believe God is still with you. Believe that God's light in you is stronger. And finally this, believe that God has not forgotten you even when everyone else has. Joseph interprets the details of these two men's dreams even though he doesn't understand his own dream. In three days, the chief sommelier was restored to his position in three days, the head 
waiter was executed. But before the cupbearer left prison, he begged him. Joseph begged him. He said, remember me. When you go back to Pharaoh, plead my case. Get me out of this pit. The cupbearer went back to Pharaoh and immediately he forgot Joseph. For two years, he forgot all about him until Pharaoh had two dreams one night. And the cupbearer said, you know what? I remember a guy. Beloved, don't you get discouraged when others' dreams come true before yours do. Don't get discouraged when others move on ahead of you and you're stuck in the same place for a little while. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. When we were raising money to build this building, it was a grind the entire way. During that time, I, I had a pastor friend whose church also needed a building like we did. And he called me very excited one day. He said, Glenn, you will never believe what happened to us. He said, out of the blue, I, I got a call from a man who owns a building in our city. The man said to me, he said, I've never spoken to the man before, but he said to me, I've thought about your request and I'm calling to offer you my building for one dollar. Apparently, another church had called this man and asked him to consider selling the building at a discount, but the owner of the building had misplaced that church's information. My pastor friend said to him, sir, he said, we, we need a building, but he said, I'm very sorry to tell you, I'm not the one who called you. It was a different church who contacted you. The owner paused for a minute and he said, well, do you want it or not? And they got a beautiful building in a primo location for one dollar. I'm glad you're happy because I wasn't. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to be happy for your friend, but you were just really struggling? You, you, you know, I wanted to be happy for them. I really did. But I felt like God had forgotten us. A little while that, after that, another pastor friend called me. Her church needed to build a building, and so she called to ask some questions about our capital campaign. She knew that we had done one. So I introduced her to the pastor who was so helpful to us, and the two of them started working together. A little while later, I decided to call her just as a courtesy and out of friendship to see how things were going, and she said to me, oh, it went well. I said, it went well? And she said, yeah, we're all done. In one month, they raised triple what we raised in five years. We raised $5 million in five years. They raised $15 million in one month. I wanted to be happy for them. I really did. But it was hard not to feel like the Lord had forgotten us. I wonder how long it took Joseph to realize that the cupbearer forgot all about him. Did he hold on to hope for a week, for a month? Did he hold on for six months? Surely after two full years went by, there wasn't even a flicker of hope left in him. I'm pretty sure that at that point it seemed like Mrs. Potiphar had won and that Joseph's dreams were over. But then he heard his name one day. Joseph, get up, hurry. Pharaoh is summoning you. You see, the reason that Joseph's dream took a little longer is because God had a lot further for him to go. God didn't just plan to restore Joseph to being Potiphar's household manager. God planned to make Joseph second in command in all the land of Egypt over the cupbearer, over the new baker, over the prison warden, over Potiphar, over Mrs. Potiphar, over Potiphar's house staff, over his brothers, over his father. So don't get discouraged 
If others seem to be realizing their dreams before you, the interpretation belongs to God, theirs and yours. And let the fulfillment of their dreams be a sign that you're next. It's just taking a little longer because God has planned for you to go a lot further. You know why we didn't get all the mil all the money at once to build our building? Because if we had, we would have never ended up building phase two. We didn't know that at the time, but God did. And here we are 15 years later, and I don't mean any disrespect to my friends in any way, but they aren't building anymore. But guess what? We are. It's taken us just a little longer because God had just a little further for us to go. God gives us dreams, but the interpretation belongs to him. He makes a promise, and then there's a process to go through. Let me close with this, and we're done. God's promise is his gift to us, but our faithfulness to God during the process is our gift to him. There was an American missionary who served her entire adult life in Eastern Africa. She and her husband moved to the mission field as a young married couple. They built a medical station, a school, a church, translated scriptures. They had four children on the field. They buried two of them on the field. And after the woman's husband died, she stayed for another decade serving the people that she loved. When she finally decided to retire and move home to America, the tribal people gathered around her to say farewell. And each member of the village brought her a gift. But she was particularly taken by a seashell that one man pressed into her hand. There was nothing special about the seashell. It was quite ordinary. But it occurred to the woman that it must have come from over 200 miles away. And indeed, she found out that the man had walked for two weeks from the village all the way to the seacoast and had brought the shell back as his gift. She said to him, thank you for this exquisite gift. You must have made a very long journey to get it. And the man said to her, Mother, the journey is the gift. Beloved, the interpretation belongs to God. The details of how our story plays out belong to God. The prolonged, circuitous process belongs to God. The purpose of it all belongs to God. And maybe when people look at the final outcome of our life, they don't see anything extraordinary at all. They say you went through all that for just this. But our faithfulness to God on the journey is our gift to him. Cling to faith while God is working on your interpretation. Believe he's with you. Believe that his spirit within you is powerful. And believe that he hasn't forgotten you, even if everyone else has. Would you stand on your feet this morning and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a good praise?